Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin, and um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some work that has been going on over the past few years on uh, human sequencing and human variation detection using uh, long read sequencing. And um, just kind of a perspective about where things have been going in, in, the, in the past is that um, the number of, of human genomes that have been available uh, over time has been about doubling since about 2015. So we had about one and a half uh, human genomes. I say a half because one of the human genomes that was sequenced in 2015 was just a, a haploid cell line um, to uh, about to four trios that were available a couple of years ago. And then now we're around 10 um, uh, unrelated individuals with another genome that became available in 2018. And I'll talk a little bit later on about um, the amount of genomes that are being sequenced in 2019 uh, and beyond. And so uh, some of the motivation to do the single molecule sequencing of humans came about with some original uh, early studies on the ability to do de novo assembly using single molecule sequencing and the ability to call variants using the sequencing. So on the left uh, are uh, the results of um, uh, doing uh, a single molecule sequencing assembly of a gorilla genome. Um, the, the panels on the left represent the largest 300 megabases of contigs uh, from the single molecule sequencing assembly, and on the right are the uh, largest 300 megabases contigs uh, using a short read assembly. So you can see a very large, essentially a three order of magnitude increase in contiguity of the single molecule sequencing assemblies versus the short read sequencing assemblies. And on the right uh, is a histogram of the number of variants, of structural variants that are found in a haploid cell line um, with respect to size of the variant and a shading that shows the novelty of the variant with respect to uh, the databases of known variation at the time. And essentially what you could find was 20 to 30,000 structural variants per genome with about 80% of the variants being novel with respect to the known genetic variation. So this is sort of driving the motivation to do uh, newer single molecules, newer sequencing of human genomes with single molecule sequencing. So we won't get into the me uh, mechanisms of how the different technologies to do this work, but we can just look at some of the raw data that's generated by some of the newer uh, versions of the runs of this type of sequencing. And what we can see is that um, the, the reads that are produced uh, uh, range in length between a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of base pairs. And then the accuracy of the sequences that are produced uh, ranges between about 80 and, and 95%. And then the two different clusters that are shown here are from the two different, the, the main two um, sequencing platforms, either the, the Oxford Nanopore, which is in red, and uh, the PacBio, which is in uh, blue here. And so what you can think of this is, is two different sort of axes that you have with this type of data, where you have this uh, new opportunity with the ability to do uh, uh, assembly and variant detection with this type of sequencing, but then you have a bit of a challenge uh, with respect to uh, the lower accuracy that, uh, that's present in this type of sequencing. And so what we can think of is we can start to compare some of the analysis pipelines that are used with either Illumina sequencing versus some of the pipelines that are used with um, uh, with single molecule sequencing. And with, with short read sequencing, there's not a lot of uh, variability with respect to the sort of um, steps, basic steps that are done in analysis. You'll do sequencing. There's fairly rigorous um, protocols to do the sequencing. Um, you do an alignment step, and then you do sort of a couple of different flavors of uh, variant detection between SNP detection, SV detection, or copy number variation detection. And it's, it's a bit more complex of a picture with single molecule sequencing variant analysis in the sense that once you do sequencing, well, first you have a couple of different decisions to make of which different platform to go through. And then you have a few different types of analysis that one can do between either alignment-based analysis or assembly-based analysis. And within each of those categories, there's different decisions that you can make for the type of analysis that you can do. So today I'll talk a little bit about the two different main sort of aspects for uh, analysis of uh, long read sequencing data. First, the alignment uh, type of an approach, and then second, the assembly approach. Oops. Okay, so uh, 
the alignment-based approach, which I'm kind of loosely naming plurality, is it's, it's very useful uh, in um, cases where the coverage that you have per genome is, is too low to assemble, so it's around 10x per haplotype. Um, and the basic uh, uh, kind of characteristics of this approach is that you can detect it directly from the alignments of reads to genome, not from assemblies. Uh, because the reads have low accuracy, the ability to define uh, breakpoints with high accuracy becomes a bit diminished. Um, the diminished accuracy of breakpoint detection uh, increases the lower bound of the size of variant that can be found to about 10 to 15 or so uh, base pairs. Um, but what's nice about this is just by based on read depth analysis, you can apply sort of a binomial model and um, uh, guess at what the, the genotype of the variant is. So the basic steps that, that's, uh, that are performed is in the first step, you'll run um, alignment of the reads to the genome. In the next step, um, most major methods that do this will do so some sort of clustering of the breakpoints, and then in a final step where you have um, a call of, of what uh, the variant is. And so I'm listing three different uh, popular methods to, to do this. So we wanted to uh, develop a new alignment method. So it was shown in 2018 from some pioneering work by Fred Sedzelik that the uh, calls that you get, because you have this noisy data coming in, are very dependent on the type of alignment that's done. And so if you do alignment with a method that isn't uh, based on essentially allowing a gap model that, uh, that accurately reflects genetic variation, that with single molecule sequencing, the, diffuse, the signal of where the variants are will be somewhat diffuse. So what we were working on is uh, a new alignment approach, which we call LRA, which um, uh, combines the benefits of a gap model that's able to accurately model human genetic variation, as well as an optimization that uh, uses some sparse uh, dynamic programming. And so um, on the top, we're comparing just al alignments of raw reads using what's sort of the state-of-the-art method um, by Hung Lee, which is Minimap2. It's an extremely fast method that gives extremely good results on almost all data. So we're actually kind of just optimizing a small fraction of the remaining results that can be found with, with alignments. But we can see that LRA is able to get a slightly better um, a number of reads that are able to span um, uh, deletion breakpoints in this particular example that's shown. So we're still kind of sanding the edges on this method, so a full comparison isn't quite uh, ready, but Aaron Wenger at uh, Pacific Biosciences ran some analysis for us that were able to compare um, uh, results using the L uh, LRA as a drop-in um, aligner using his uh, variant color, which is called PBSV. And so the two methods to sort of compare directly would be the, uh, uh, this top right corner with the bottom left corner, and roughly what's going on is that, that using this method that has this sparse dynamic programming optimization built into it, you have slightly better sensitivity with some of the larger insertion and uh, deletion events. Okay, so moving on to the other sort of flavor of analysis that's done is the assembly-based approach for detecting uh, a genetic variation. So this is uh, appealing because Instead of calling variants directly from single reads, what you can do is assemble all of the reads together, run some sort of consensus method on that assembly, and then map that back and call variation from that. And that's nice because the, the consensus of the reads is a much more accurate version of individual uh, single molecule sequencing reads, and you can get much higher um, accuracy on the breakpoints that are identified. And that higher accuracy allows one to, to also detect um, a smaller uh, uh, variants in the study. So immediately, one of the things that becomes a problem when you're looking at doing a de novo assembly is that, um, with the exception of those first couple of studies that were done on haploid cell lines, most of the sequencing that we do is on diploid samples. And so what you can think of is some, uh, <coughs> a diploid genome will have combinations of variants on both haplotypes. When you do an assembly of that, it merges all of the data together and just uh, what's, there's different versions of this, but you can generally define them all as versions of what are called assembly graphs, where you have um, edges that represent sequences and branches that represent variation that happens. And uh, <clears throat> the final uh, output of an assembly method that's not aware of the fact that we're assembling diploid genomes 
is some sort of uh, random sampling of the different variants that can happen uh, uh, within the assembly graph. And so if we take that haploid assembly and map that back, we'll actually only find about 50% of the variants that are happening within our genome. So it becomes clear that what we first actually need to do is either have an assembly method that's aware of the fact that we're doing uh, assembly on diploid genomes, or what we can do is just take our sequencing data and actually partition it by haplotype prior to uh, assembly itself. And so what that means is what we can have is a set of phased uh, SNPs in a genome that we're looking at. This is kind of phasing a known a priori. And we can just compare our sequencing reads to this phasing and count how often they share SNPs with one haplotype or the other. And then depending on uh, which haplotype they share the most variance with, we can sort of bin them uh, by haplotype. So here we can say read one is haplotype zero, read two is haplotype one, and so on. So with that in mind, um, this was sort of one of the main steps in some of the sequencing that was done um, in a study that was completed just a, uh, about six months ago by the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium. And what this consortium did is it took three different trios uh, to try and survey uh, different types of classes of variation between um, uh, low heterozygosity, uh, high heterozygosity, and, um, uh, and admixture genomes. And we took as many different technologies as possible and sequenced these, these trios with these technologies and then called variation um, on them. And so we could kind of bin the different technologies that we applied to this into three categories. Short read, long read, and chromosomal scale. So short read is standard Illumina sequencing, long read is single molecule sequencing, uh, as well as 10x and um, uh, bio-nanogenomics. I won't get into those, the results of those two technologies at all today, unfortunately. And then finally, chromosomal scale. So these are data technologies that are able to tell if two separate reads are present uh, from the same chromosome, even if they're uh, sequenced from opposite uh, uh, ends of the chromosome. And the first thing that we did with this, uh, these different combinations of data was to look at how well we could phase heterozygous SNPs in the genome. So what we wanted to do was eventually do essentially haplotype-based assembly or assembly on haplotype partition reads, and that partitioning needs um, uh, phasing done. So we had trios, and we could have done phasing based on um, just inheritance, but we wanted to actually look at how well technologies themselves could phase uh, sequencing data. So the main technology that is sort of new relative to all of the technologies that were shown on the previous slide that was actually extremely useful in phasing is something called uh, strand seq data. So this is a single cell sequencing approach in where uh, cells are replicated in the presence of BRDU. And then after a couple of uh, sample preparation steps, in individual cells are sequenced and the reads are mapped back to a genome. And if it turns out that you have um, from one cell reads mapping to both strands of a genome, all of the reads uh, from one strand came from uh, one uh, chromosome. And so anytime you have two reads from the same mapping to the same strand, they're from the same chromosome, therefore you can infer that they're, they're in phase. So the output of this is essentially telomere to telomere phasing of heterozygous uh, SNPs in, in the genome. It's a bit low of coverage, so what we wanted to do is look at the ability to combine different technologies, so strand seq technology plus other technologies to get chromosomal phasing of our data. So if we look at uh, just what's available with just uh, short read sequencing and how well we're able to, to link heterozygous SNPs, so the N50, or the fragment size that um, the, the length of uh, uh, distance between two phase SNPs such that at least half of the, the number of uh, bases that are phased or greater is contained in a particular size refers to the N50 size of uh, the phasing, so you have a very small phasing of uh, heterozygous SNPs using uh, stock short read uh, sequencing data. Um, if we move up to uh, the long read sequencing data that we had at the time, this had about an average fragment length of around 10,000 base pairs. We're able to get about a, a half of a megabase and 50 of phasing of sequence data. 
If we look at the 10x sequencing data, that uh, goes up by another order of magnitude. So we have about a, a 14 to 15 megabase and 50 of um, uh, fragment size, of, of uh, phasing block size. And then finally, what we can look at are some of the, what are called uh, the, the chromosome scale phasing. And so if we apply high C sequencing and phasing, this is able to get um, uh, nearly chromosome uh, scale. So some of the high C uh, phases were actually broken across um, the centromere. But if we add either StrandSeq or StrandSeq plus additional technologies, what we're able to get is essentially telomere to telomere dense phasing of heterozygous SNPs in the genome. So given the phasing of the heterozygous SNPs, what we can do is we can just align the reads back to the genome, do this partitioning by haplotype, assemble the different haplotypes separately, and then call variation based on those uh, assemblies. So um, <clears throat> this was on somewhat early data, and so the assemblies had N50s between about 1.3 to about 7 megabases per haplotype. So with newer data, we're actually able to get assemblies on the order of 20 megabases N50s per haplotype. So we're seeing haplotype-specific assemblies with current data that rival the contiguity of the original release of the human genome. When we apply consensus methods to the um, assemblies, we're able to get about QV30 assemblies, so 99.9% .9 accurate assemblies with the data that we had at the time. And this is only using uh, uh, PAC bio input for the assembly. So if you add an Illumina step where you look at consensus between the assembly and Illumina, you're able to get a couple of point increase in uh, the accuracy of the assembly. If we map these back, what we're able to do is we can detect variation. Importantly, what we see is essentially full-scale uh, detection of variation, all the way from uh, what are essentially uh, tens of kilobases down to a two-base pair uh, variant size. And what we can do is we can actually just compare the variants that we find in this, with this assembly-based approach to the variants that we find using high-coverage Illumina sequencing with uh, with a large set of other callers. And what we're able to see is that, well, there's a, a decent amount of agreement um, between uh, 1 and 50 base pairs, actually about 1 and 15 base pairs for uh, small insertions and deletions between the assemblies and the Illumina data. Once you get between about 15 and 500 base pairs, you see a large increase in the sensitivity of variation that's detected using this assembly-based approach versus what one would find in a typical Illumina sequencing data set. So we look specifically at the haplotypes and the classes of variation that we're able to find between um, uh, assembled haplotypes. So we see about a two to one ratio of insertion to deletion uh, uh, structural variants uh, in each uh, haplotype. And what we also see are a large number of essentially clusters of uh, variants where you see um, regions where you can't necessarily determine if there's specifically some number of insertions or deletions. And those clusters turn out to be highly variable tandem repeat sequences within the human genome. So specifically, we actually see that the majority of the variation that we find within these human genomes is focused uh, on tandem repeat variation. So around 70% of the variants that we find with the assembly-based approach are in, inside of tandem repeats, and around another 15% uh, are within mobile elements. One of the nice things that having the assemblies gives you is uh, the ability to go back and look at the, the um, specific nucleotide compositions of the breakpoints uh, of the variants that are found, and you can actually look at what are called the Kamer compositions of the breakpoints. So sequences of some short length K, or K is maybe 22 bases, and um, <clears throat> you can build uh, essentially um, uh, hash tables of the cameras that are present in Illumina sequencing data sets, and in a very rapid way, around one second per uh, genome, we're able to genotype all of, well, a, a subset of the variants that we find using the assembly approach in an Illumina genome. So now we can actually get a set of calls from a single pack bio genome or a single pack bio haplotype that's shown here, and then we can get its population frequency in a very short amount of time for uh, a specific subset of samples that, uh, of uh, variants that we find. 
If we look at the composition of the type of, um, of, of how much the variants affect uh, genes, we're able to see um, uh, a slight gain, so around 12 frame shift genes per genome uh, in the PAC bio genomes versus Illumina genomes. Uh, those are for deletion, and we see a larger increase in the number of uh, frame shifts that we're able to detect uh, using the PAC bio sequencing over the Illumina sequencing per genome. So we don't just want to know about the number of genes that we're able to detect this type of um, uh, uh, frame shift event in, but we want to know whether or not these are actually affecting human health. And so we can plot uh, just kind of a rank ordering of the PLI, or the, the sensitivity to, um, to variation uh, that we see uh, from the variants that, that are detected, and this is shown uh, the PLI of uh, genes that are affected by SVs that we're able to detect in Illumina sequencing. And so we see some kind of uh, limited number, around 10%, that have a high PLI, so high or low uh, tolerance to uh, variation. And um, if we want to consider what's going on with what we find in this assembly-based approach, if we see this a large increase in the number of genes that are uh, affected that have high PLI, we're finding very uh, genes that are impactful of human health. But it turns out that for the most part, what we find, although we're able to find more uh, variants um, uh, that affect genes, these variants essentially just add, uh, are, are adding variants that we find in genes that are fairly tolerant to uh, variation. So for the most part, we're, we're finding variants that um, probably are having low impact on human health. These are in um, healthy human individuals, so we don't have any reason to believe that we're going to find more genes that uh, have impacted their health. So, uh, and we see a similar pattern for both insertions and deletions, where we see an increase in the number of uh, SVs that affect genes, but uh, not many of these um, SVs affect uh, uh, health. Similarly, we only find about an 11% to 23% increase in the number of sort of important non-coding, so either transcription factor binding or conserved uh, elements within the genome. So finally, closing, we'll talk about the future of uh, human genetics. So we said there's about a doubling every year of genomes that are sequenced. In the next year, we're going to see around uh, 30 or so uh, trios and around 50 other human genomes sequenced by um, PacBio in some unknown number. I'm less connected to the nanopore community. Um, but what's driving this is the fact that um, for <clears throat> the time that the single molecule sequencing has been around, while these sort of haploid cell lines were done, every run was about a billion base pairs. On um, the last couple of years, it's been up to about 10 gigabytes per run or gigabases per run. And now we're seeing runs where every individual run is capable of sequencing uh, a human genome and uh, producing uh, variation from this. So essentially the take home message from this is that what we have is a, a realm now where large scale human uh, sequencing studies can be done using this long read sequencing approach. So I wanna thank the whole community from the, the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium and uh, there's another story that's on um, assembly by phasing that unfortunately I didn't have time to get into. Uh, and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Mark.